Uh, hello everyone, my name is Cynthia Lum. I'm a professor at George Mason University. And uh, today I have the great pleasure of interviewing uh, David Weisberg, professor at George Mason University for the Oral History Criminology Project, the American Society of Criminology. Uh, professor Weisberg holds a joint appointment as a distinguished professor in the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society at George Mason. He's also the Walter E. Meyer Professor of Law and Criminal Justice at the Hebrew University Law School in Jerusalem. He's the founder and director of the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy at George Mason University and also a senior fellow at the Police Foundation in Washington, D.C., uh, as well as chair of their research advisory committee. David holds a Ph.D. in sociology from Yale University. In 2010, uh, Professor Weisberg re received the Stockholm Prize, which is the highest international distinction that a criminologist can achieve. Congratulations, David. Uh, for his achievements in place-based criminology, displacement, um, experimental research in these areas. But David's work does not stop at place-based research or experimental criminology. He is a, a prolific scholar uh, whose work spans the field of criminology, law, and society. And he's published widely uh, in areas of policing, drugs and crime, statistical methods, white-collar crime, terrorism, counterterrorism and social control. Uh, he's written over 15 books in these areas and many, many uh, articles. Professor Weisberg's awards, accolades, and accomplishments are extensive, and I'd like to highlight just a few here. He's the founding editor of the Journal of Experimental Criminology. He serves on a number of editorial boards. He's an elected fellow of the American Society of Criminology and of the Academy of Experimental Criminology. He's also the chair of the Division of Experimental Criminology at ASC. He serves as the co-chair of the steering committee uh, of the Campbell Crime and Justice Group, an international collaboration for advancing evidence-based research. And he's a member of the Campbell Collaboration International Steering Group. In 2010, he was appointed as a member of the Science Advisory Board Office of, for the Office of Justice Programs, Department of Justice, where he serves as chair of the NIJ subcommittee. He's also a member of the National Research Council Committee on Crime, and, Crime Law and Justice and of the National Institute of Justice Harvard University Executive Session in Policing. Uh, I'm especially pleased to interview David today as one of his students and now uh, a colleague at George Mason University. Aside from his many accomplishments, David is widely known as being one of the top mentoring criminologists in the field and contributing to efforts that advance others in the discipline more generally. His intellectual generosity, his care for his students have no doubt led them to make important contributions in the field of policing, crime and place, experimental criminology, and folks like Lorraine Masral, Anthony Braga, Anthony Petrosino, Liz Groff, Suming Yang, Tal Jonathan, Brock Ariel, Cody Tellup, myself, we've all benefited greatly from David's mentorship. Okay, so David, with that introduction, uh, I'd like to begin by asking you about some of your mentors and um, how you became involved in criminology. Maybe uh, uh, if you could speak a little bit about some of the specific areas of research uh, that you focus on, how you got involved with those. First of all, Cynthia, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, my mentors at Yale, there were two people who were most influential. One was uh, Al Reese and the other was Stan Wheeler. And at the time, they were giants. I mean, they, they were sort of bigger than life. Uh, you have to remember, there weren't criminology programs per se when I first started my career. I shouldn't say that. There were a few criminology programs, but not very many. Uh, not like today, where students who want to study crime or uh, the criminal justice system end up uh, going to the University of Maryland or George Mason or Cincinnati or Albany or other places. Uh, and uh, St Stan was located in sociology, but more in the law school, and Al was located in sociology. Indeed, I think he was chair of the department when I came. Uh, they were both uh, 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 interesting people and very different styles. Uh, Al was incredibly tough. Uh, he was the kind of person that students would sit there and after being criticized, you could see they'd want to cry, but would be controlling themselves. Uh, uh, he was just tough. He, he didn't tolerate uh, any nonsense. It wasn't personal, but if something was stupid, it was stupid. Uh, and he, he was tough and he let you know it. And he, he didn't uh, 
favor his favorite students in that regard. Uh, if, if, if you were unprepared, you regretted it without. Um, but uh, that toughness, I think, from the very beginning, gave me a sense that our work is important, it has to be done well. Uh, uh, it taught me the importance of, of methodological rigor, um, uh, of looking to criticize issues. But, but Al actually gave me another um, uh, way of thinking about the world that uh, is stuck with me uh, ever since, which was that he had a habit of, he didn't care whether you could regurgitate things. He wanted you to say something new and interesting he hadn't thought about before. So his criterion for a good class was you're raising issues that made him think about new issues. And uh, uh, that idea of looking for something new uh, uh, really stuck with me later on. And he, uh, when he did that, he, he knew that when you would create new ideas, they weren't going to be as well formed as recreating old ideas. In our field sometimes, people get rewarded for saying the same things over and over in slightly different ways. When you stake out new territory, it's, it's always fuzzier. Uh, but Al was totally investing the idea that new territory is more uh, interesting. Uh, Stan Will was very different. Uh, Stan used to, uh, uh, he was located in law school first of all, it gave him a slightly different orientation. Uh, he had to deal with uh, uh, people that wanted to know what he was saying and didn't care about the sociological paradigms. Stan was a great uh, uh, early founder of Law and Society, and his focus in law school was precisely on that. Um, he was, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'd call it softer, his style was more, he'd have parties at his house and he played jazz, made students feel comfortable. Uh, but he, in his own way, was also incredibly intellectually tough. Uh, both of them established me a standard. Uh, uh, Stan actually didn't publish in today's world, Stan probably couldn't have become quite as central uh, uh, as he became then. He didn't publish an awful lot, but everything he published, he went over time and time again. It reinforced me the idea of being careful uh, 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 and really caring about the sort of the way something is written, the way ideas are developed. He wouldn't give a paper until it was really done to anyone. So we worked on our sentencing of white collar crime paper which was published in the American Sociological Review. It was like, before we could send it out to anyone, it was taking an awful long time, I thought. You know, that's interesting. It's there the very there are two very different styles. One that is okay with fuzzy ideas, and the other that has to, things have to be very, very um, well planned in some ways. I, right, I had confusing mentorship in that. Yeah, way. I, I was the, gonna say, uh, how, does that, uh, how does that kind of turn into your style you have a very careful style, but you're also very innovative in many ways. And I think that kind of translates into that style now. Um, yeah, I would say that, uh, that, that I, I learned from both of them. And I think that uh, hopefully I, I got some of the best aspects of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Because uh, like, like Al, I think I'd be very tough. And students are sometimes surprised at that. And I also have this focus of his, which was say something new and interesting. Uh, it's not always going to be as organized as saying something old again and again. Uh, and from Stan, it really uh, uh, gave me that sense of, uh, um, you know, you also have to make sure that it's really carefully done, fits together, etc. cetera. Um, in, my, in my style with students, I should note, I think of both of them. Because Stan could always make you feel really comfortable. Uh, uh, but, but Al also kept you on the line. Yeah, in terms I, of what you're doing. I have you to think say, so? do. yeah, I, I do. Um, just a, having been your student, I think you have a very um, a complex style of mentorship <laughs> in some ways. Um, it's not an Al Reese style because I think you're very um, nurturing in, in, to your students uh, in many ways. And, and many of us see, see each other as family members, you know. And so that, that's a, uh, I think, a, a new legacy that you leave, perhaps. Um, but uh, I, I just want to go back a little bit to um, Stan and to Al. They also studied very different things as well. Um, how did some of their work influence the work that you do now? And um, did that get you started down a path of crime in place or a policing or um, social control? 
Yeah, I think that uh, going to a sociology department rather than a chronology program, my education was probably a bit broader than many of my students. Um, and Al and uh, Stan were quite different too. Uh, Al was, uh, would be seen as one of the most important criminologists of his period. Uh, he was everywhere in some sense, you know, on an editorial book of criminology, on the Southern Ward, all those types of things. Uh, uh, but actually he thought of himself as a sociologist with an interest in crime and justice issues, um, deviance issues, etc. Uh, Stan saw himself primarily as a law and society person. Uh, so they were uh, some early founders of criminology, uh, but they weren't, didn't think of themselves quite solidly in the discipline of criminology. Indeed, when I uh, 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 developed a volume with Elon Waring in honor of Al's retirement, at one point in the discussion around the table, Al was arguing against criminology as a distinct discipline. And I was sort of arguing for it. It was not easy to argue with Al. And uh, uh, so that, that I wouldn't say I started off in criminology. Indeed, uh, certainly I was well prepared because Al was very interested in questions that we now think of as criminological. And Stan was a, a really great figure in thinking about areas like corrections or sentencing or questions like that, white collar crime. Indeed, uh, uh, Stan offered me the tremendous opportunity of working on the Yale White Collar Crime Project, which was extremely well funded, gave me a, an office in Yale Law School with a fireplace. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't quite gotten back to that yet. <laughs> um, but also, uh, 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 I ended up running a, an incredibly large data collection project on white collar offenders very early in my career when I was a graduate student. And uh, it was a, a tremendous experience. Indeed, one more thing about mentorship with Stan was that uh, he had this great ability to put everybody around the table. He had at the time a grant of millions of dollars. We're talking about uh, you know, 30 years ago. And uh, we would have meetings with all the staff. We'd sit around the table and you could be the, 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 the youngest graduate student and you get a chance to talk at the table. And if you have a good idea, it takes precedence over a senior professor. Mm -hmm. And that focus on it's the ideas that count, not the status, is also uh, uh, kept with me. But when I was finishing up at, uh, uh, at Yale, uh, I think that um, uh, I'm not sure I would have considered myself a criminologist as of yet. I, I, was, I, I did my dissertation uh, in Israel. Uh, Stan and Al were my co-chairs. I had a training grant from NIMH with Al, which supported my work in Israel. And I studied uh, uh, violence by Jewish settlers, or potential violence, uh, both against the government and against uh, Arabs in the West Bank. How long were you there in Israel? For your I was there for three years doing that research. But um, the, uh, that was the sort of, my, in, my interest was in social control. I was particularly interested in uh, the way in which uh, the settlers uh, thought of their deviant activities as activities of social control. I was also very interested in the time, at the time in uh, the effects of conflict on uh, uh, um, collectivities. For example, I was very interested in the work of Louis Koser and George Simmel, uh, uh, who posited that conflict could have positive consequences. So uh, those are the things I was thinking about. And uh, I had to go back to Yale to finish up my doctorate. And uh, at that point, uh, I kind of needed to get a job because I was married and had a child and it, we needed to put food on the table. So, uh, and I, I couldn't just be an assistantship, I actually had a job, but I wasn't quite finished with my doctorate. So uh, really through Stan, I made a contact with the Vera Institute in, uh, in New York City. And uh, I was very happy because uh, uh, they offered me uh, uh, a, a very good salary at the time. I'm not sure how it would be perceived today. But, um, uh, and they gave me a job of evaluating, being the main researcher, for evaluating what turns out to be one of the first community policing programs in the US, the pilot program in community policing at the Vera Institute of Justice. And, uh, uh, you know, it seemed like an exciting thing to do, but it was very off the beaten path. Indeed, it's an interesting, because at the time, uh, uh, my wife's family was in Israel, we were thinking of uh, uh, going back to Israel, 
And I called a, a friend of my wife's brother's, uh, who uh, was an important criminologist in Israel. And I told him about this job, and I said, what do you think, like, is a career issue? And he said to me, I, I'll never forget, he said, you know, you may never be able to get back into academia. And I thought that was maybe a bit extreme at the time, but his point was that this is not a traditional thing for you to do. You're at Yale. You should be, you know, going to Princeton or something or doing something like that. What are you doing going and walking the street with police officers? Uh, how does that fit in to a traditional academic career? So uh, the truth is, however, that the Vera Institute experience had probably more effect than almost anything else that I did in my career up until then. The walking the street four days a week with cops, and they were uh, beat cops. Uh, it was a new idea, this idea that police could walk the streets. Uh, was, uh, you know, I learned, I'd never even sort of hung out with a cop before. Uh, I hadn't seen crime and poverty and other things directly walking around, you know, in, in places that were very difficult and crime-ridden. And um, uh, it, it, it had its tremendous effect on me in terms of what my interests were. Uh, I would say that uh, this was my entrance into becoming a police scholar, though Al was a police scholar, I never worked with him in the area of policing. And it was also really my entrance to thinking of myself as a criminologist. So it was a, it, it was sort of a life-changing experience that if I'd listened to my elders, I probably would have said no. Of course, I was very hungry at the time. Mm. My family <laughs> wanted to eat. Mm. So, and this was a, it seemed like a really great job. Plus, at that age, the idea of walking around with cops it seemed like a fun thing to do for a year, and it was. So that really influenced your uh, interest in police scholarship, I guess. In police scholarship and crime and place. I mean, mm. first of all, uh, I think at the time it was less common for someone to come out of a place like Yale and also to be very interested in police. Now, Al was, of course, but, but I think that there was a period when there weren't that many top people going to the area of policing. Uh, Do you feel the same way now, David, about policing and, and young police scholars? No. I, I think that the, uh, what was happening at the time was that most of the research of the period, if you look back at it, on policing, corrections, etc., it was the does, uh, nothing works period. Uh, the Kansas City Preventive Patrol Experiment, a bunch of other st uh, studies, Spellman study on uh, 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 911 calls to the police. Uh, all these studies provided a negative context. Uh, criminologists walked around with the kind of sense that the police could do nothing about crime. Now this year I spent in, the, in New York City made me feel completely differently about it. You know, I felt the police could do something about crime. But here's the interesting thing, I mean, it both taught me tremendously about the police. Contrary to the, to the idea at the time, which I don't think is true any longer, I think uh, professors push their students to have a little experience in the field. But at the time it was conceived of as you know, not a very useful uh, uh, activity, even something that might sort of send you in the wrong direction, uh, uh, sort of wasteful during an important period of your academic development. Uh, but th the truth is that that experience taught me about what police are doing. It made me interested, by the way, in the police. And it taught me about crime. And here's the interesting issue that uh, when I gave the Stockholm lecture, I thought about influences in my career. And probably this Beer Institute influence, walking the street with cops, was tremendous not only generally, but also uh, in terms of my intellectual development and the areas I was interested in. Here's what I did. I walked the streets with cops. They were given beat areas. The beat areas were between 12, I think, and 20 square blocks. Those were bad communities. Each cop had a bad community. So I walked with them every single day. What did I find? We walked on the same three or four blocks every single day. And I said, you know what? We criminologists are thinking about these large worlds, communities, beats, precincts. And the evaluation of beer was based on that. But the reality of crime, when you're there, was focused in on one, two, three blocks. And the police tend to focus on those blocks when you gave them a chance. Mm -hmm. So you might say my interest in hot spots and crime plays develops out of the 72nd Precinct in New York. Uh, I had a slide at Stockholm that said everything I needed to know about hot spots of crime I learned in the 72nd Precinct in New York in 1985. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a tremendous influence. And again, I, for, for young people, it's, it's uh, you gotta go with your, uh, if you want to do interesting things, you go with your instincts about what's interesting. And sometimes you learn the most surprising
surprising things that have the most influence in your career. The idea of hotspots for me developed out of this experience. And I was to follow that intellectual interest and the interest of policing mm. from then on. Mm. How, uh, after the experience with Vera, did you stay in New York? Did you go to, um, you went back to Israel for a, a time as well to continue your uh, academic career there. Well, actually, Can you I. Tell me a little bit about yeah. after, what happened after Vera. It's interesting, when I was at Vera, it was a very tough period for a criminologist or sociologist, really. And uh, so I was at Vera and I was looking for a job. And uh, I read this uh, 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 ad that Al Reese sent me, I was always an interesting guy, about the Army Institute of Research. So it turned out that the Army Institute of Research at the time was under the Reagan administration, was booming. Uh, for example, I went down there for a job interview and they had computers stacked in the wall, like a hundred of them. Now, computers at the time were like Big. very valuable <laughs> and they had them stacked on the wall. I said to myself, this is interesting. And what they were looking for was someone who would uh, both play a role in looking at uh, problems in Israel and in Eastern Europe, the, the border with the Soviet Union at the time. And their interest was, they were very interested, I should say, in my work on social cohesion. Because I was very interested at the time in how, for example, gentrification in a neighborhood, how people that did that, how it actually had some positive benefits, how people went to those neighborhoods, because it felt good, you felt like you were doing so, you, you were, uh, had strong contact with other people. But that related also uh, to issues in the military. Did, did uh, soldiers on the frontier in Eastern Europe, uh, did they have, um, did that affect them in negative ways, stress, et cetera, or in positive ways of being, having stronger connections with their peers, et cetera? How could you foster that kind of social cohesion? They were also interested in the time, uh, it was right after the Lebanese War, I believe, and they were interested in how uh, uh, the Lebanese War uh, affected uh, issues of social cohesion and units in Israel, they'd gotten permission from the Israeli army to look at this question. So they were very interested in this topic. And I was kind of like, this is going to be like going to the Vera Institute. This would be fun. So I, I got this close to joining the army as a captain, actually. And then uh, I got. I, a I love this story, David, because it, uh, the young folks that are watching this uh, will know that you cannot plan your life out sometimes. <laughs> my life. But, but, the, uh, but then I got, at that point, Al Reese also uh, recommended me for a, a job at Rutgers. And Al was an interesting guy because his recommendation, I was told, was like, he wrote a letter to Don Gopritson, who was the dean at the time, something like one sentence letter saying, you know, you'd be lucky to get him, I'm just not sure he would go there. <laughs> something of this sort. <laughs> the, um, and I went there for an interview and it was great. I, I immediately realized that my place was in criminology. Uh, Don Gopritson, uh, Frieda, Todd Clare, um, there was a, a group of really, uh, uh, um, uh, of, of really interesting senior people, people who sort of, uh, where I am in my career, even uh, farther along. And I just felt like, wow, these people are, uh, these are the kind of questions that I'm interested in. Uh, Don Gopritson, actually, I'm sure he's been mentioned in other interviews here. He was a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, when I came, usually go for a job interview and people stress you out. Uh, I'm not sure why we do these things. It goes for uh, two days, you know, you go for dinner and lunch and all these kinds of things. Uh, actually, Cambridge University, I, I'm on a, a selection committee there and they, they have these like two hour job interviews. I, maybe there's something to that, maybe, or maybe there's something in between. But anyway, so I went to Rutgers for my interview. In the middle of the interview, uh, or, or it's actually after I'd given my talk and they'd already seen, they made a quick decision about me, I went into Don's office and he had a couch and Don was a psychologist uh, and he practiced before in the prisons, etc. And he sits me down on his couch and he puts on some classical music and the whole atmosphere is very calm and he starts saying to me, we really want you to come, uh, you know, and uh, it, was, it was just, I walked out of this interview, I said to Shelley, my wife Shelley, and I said, uh, I said, you know, this is really where I want to be, these people are great. And the truth was, it, it was a really great place for criminology. That, um, two years later, I think it was, maybe a year later, uh, um, uh, we invited Ron Clark to come as dean. Mm -hmm. Don decided to retire. And uh, that opened up another new direction for me because here I was thinking about crime and place, small worlds, and comes a, a scholar who is uh, challenging the boundaries uh, in another sort of direction, talking about situational prevention, mm -hmm. opportunity theories of crime. Mm -hmm. 
and, and that had a tremendous influence sort of bringing these ideas together. Now, let me just, one more interesting thing about Rutgers. Uh, the year, uh, 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 a year after that, I think, or, or in the third year I was there, uh, as sometimes happens, I was put on a committee with two other faculty who were senior, and they sort of didn't do much work. But so I ended up doing all the work, and uh, uh, it was to select. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen anymore. No, it's, it was to select an honorary professor, uh, and uh, and so I, in essence, got to choose someone to come. And uh, Al Reese, uh, one of his other students, was uh, Larry Sherman. And Larry, he suggested I call Larry. So I called Larry, and I said, "Would you like to come?" And uh, he said yes. And you know, at that time. He was a, a bit ahead of me in careers. He was already a full professor and quite distinguished. And he came, we sat down, and we started talking about things. And he started talking about the study he had done in Minneapolis, in which he found the crime was very concentrated. And I told him about these experiences I'd had in New York. And the two of us set out on this enterprise of uh, 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 policing, uh, uh, hotspots policing. So it's interesting how these things all came together in the sort of Rutgers uh, context. Rutgers was a great place then. Um, while you were at Rutgers, did you then decide to go to Hebrew University? There was a time period where you had left to go to uh, to Israel and then came back to the U.S. Well, I, I actually stayed in was Israel that after, to some degree. Was that after the Minneapolis Hotspots experiment? Well, we got the Minneapolis Hotspots experiment going, and after it was after that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that experiment, in retrospect, and the work Larry and I did together, which spurred both of our thinking. His 1989 articles written when we were sitting and discussing these issues, uh, the other hotspots experiments developed out of this, etc. Um, the uh, it, it, when I'd gotten tenure at Rutgers and became an associate professor, uh, I had uh, my wife had uh, family was in Israel, and it was very important to her to spend some time there. Uh, she really wanted to spend more than some time. We said, let's go for a year. So I went on sabbatical at that point uh, for a year. And after a year, uh, I was offered a, 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 a tenured professorship at Hebrew University Law School, and for family reasons in good part, but also for uh, uh, professional reasons of perhaps having a broader approach to, uh, or more international approach at least, to criminology. Uh, at that point, I decided to move to Hebrew U. There's another story interesting about that. When, when I decided to move, I, I went to Al, uh, Al Reese, and, uh, uh, we sat down to talk about it because I wanted his advice and he sat and listened and uh, he said, you know, I really understand why you're going, David. I mean, there are a lot of personal reasons and family reasons. He said, but you know, you're, uh, you're sort of on a trajectory to become one of the most important uh, crime and justice scholars, criminological scholars in the U.S. And th that probably can't happen if you leave. And uh, um, I remember at the time thinking, well, I mean, I don't know. This seems like the right thing to do, like going to the Bureau Institute of Justice. Uh, and uh, I sort of went off with that, like, uh, troubling uh, concept. My, I guess my, my thought was to Al that, you're right, Al, I wouldn't be able to perhaps have the same impact in the U.S. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I'd be able to have impact in Israel, which was also important to me at the time and uh, perhaps more of an international impact. Because the Hebrew University was, uh, is a very important international center for academic life with connections all over the world. Uh, it, it's uh, being at the law school at the Hebrew University, which is where I went, they have an institute of criminology uh, that's graduate study, uh, has a sort of broader intellectual context, both within law and more generally. Very high prestige university, within Israel certainly, and around the world. So I thought, well, maybe I'll lose a bit in the American context, but maybe I'll gain a bit in sort of my intellectual development, and it'll lead me to new places. So Al sort of left me with that, and he meant it only in the most positive ways, but uh, what was surprising to me in a way, again, when I had to give the Stockholm Prize lecture, uh, and when I was also invited later uh, to teach at the University of Maryland, and other ways in which I've been active in the U.S., I realized that it maybe it did have some sort of effect, but it did all the things I thought it would do. In other words, it did give me a broader international focus. Uh, it did make me a bit intellectually broader. The law school was quite challenging. Uh, and it also allowed me, if you put in the effort, 
not only the effort, the world has changed with the video conferencing and computers and other things. It was part of a new world that I think Al couldn't understand, but you can be in multiple places at once. Did, did it shape your thinking about hotspots and experiments? Uh, you left very soon after um, the Minneapolis hotspots experiment. Um, did, did you think about different, um, uh, did you take on new intellectual ventures when you were at Hebrew? Or were you influenced uh, by the work that you did in hotspots and in experiments? Yeah, that's interesting. How did it influence your uh, intellectual work? I had done so much uh, early in my career. Uh, I had run a number of research programs, including Minneapolis with Larry, mm -hmm. the Jersey City hotspots, uh, violent crime hotspots experiment, the Jersey City drug right. market experiment. Uh, these studies, Oakland Beat Health, which Lorraine took over, uh, uh, Anthony Braga worked on the Von Crime study, but I had a lot of work that was developing. I also, I think different from many students, I had finished at this point in my career two books, one published by Yale Press, Crimes in Middle Classes, based on the white collar crime research I did with Stan and others, but I was the senior writer on that, and a book based on my dissertation called Jewish Settle Violence. So I actually had a sort of whole group of things that I was doing Going to Israel at that point sort of gave me a break to think about what I was doing in a way. It wasn't that, that Israel was a break, but I had lots of new requirements when I was there, uh, teaching in a new place, uh, teaching a different language and things of this sort. But um, it, it did give me a chance to sort of contemplate a bit more. I was sort of thrust out of the traditional, the kind of, in, I was in a very intensive environment of people uh, Larry Sherman, John Eck, myself, my students, Lorraine Green Maserell, Anthony Braga, and others, uh, Ron Clark, Marcus Felsen. Uh, a lot of people were focused very much on this uh, emerging area of interest. And going to Hebrew sort of gave me some breathing space. Uh, I went to, uh, I was a visiting professor in Tübingen for a few weeks, one year, for example. It allowed me to sort of go into other places, and that sort of honed in uh, some of these ideas. It actually also uh, created a group of possibilities that I hadn't even considered at the time, which were that uh, a lot of people were very interested in my work. So people would invite me as a consultant or help them design proposals, and that also in an interesting way, which I might not have done if I stayed in the, spa in the States, uh, helped me to sort of develop my thinking a bit. And this happened for a group of years. And then uh, I had an invitation from the Police Foundation to run the Police Foundation Research Group. And that turned to be the sort of next stage of effect on my work and also strengthened my work in policing. Because I had a whole group of interesting ideas that I'd been developing over a three or four year period that had been developed from this intensive period of research that I'd done uh, when I was at Rutgers and continue to do during this period and follow up on. Uh, I continued to run the center I was working at at Rutgers, but in a much less intensive way. Um, and so when I came to the Police Foundation, uh, I, uh, 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 I had a reservoir of ideas that I was dying to carry out, and the Police Foundation was attractive to me because it provided an environment from which I could do that. Um, and the Police Foundation is an interesting story of itself. Um, the Police Foundation at the time, the reason why this all happened was that, you know, the connectivity of academic life and serendipitous things that happened along the way. The foundation had had, had a, a bad period. Uh, the foundation was living off an endowment, and the stock market was bad for a few years. Uh, a group of researchers that were there during a period of change and decline in resources had to leave. There were many conflicts, as sometimes happens in academia. Uh, and to some degree, the research unit had died. And here we are, the Police Foundation, established in the 1970s to advance American policing. Uh, supported with incredibly large grants and then an endowment by the Ford Foundation, producing some of those important experiments in policing, the Minneapolis, uh, uh, not, uh, not Minneapolis, uh, uh, the um, Kansas City Preventive mm -hmm. Patrol Experiment, uh, uh, community policing, the, the foot patrol experiment in Newark. Uh, George Kelling was a researcher who grew out of this. Larry Sherman uh, had been the director of research for a while. And all of a sudden, they're like zero. But the stock market had improved, and they had money, and they had reputation, and they had strong connections in the world of police. And you had your ideas. And I had my ideas developed because I. Can you talk a little bit about I, those uh, ideas, David? Well, let, let me, I will, but let yeah. me just tell you about the situation because 
the, uh, when they asked me to come and run the research group, I thought it was crazy. You know, I was thinking of Al, like I can't, that may not be a reasonable thing to do. I said, well, how do you want me to run your research group? Now, why were they coming to me? In part because the criminologist and their board was Frida Adler, who was one of the people that hired me at Rutgers. And I developed a good relationship and knew my work. And she told the board, she said, we need one of the world's most important younger police scholars. And most American police scholars like that are gonna be in universities in the United States. And there, there's gonna be tension there. He said, David is, uh, 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 may not have those tensions. So we went through the, uh, and she was right, by the way, because the Hebrew University did not view this as competitive. They viewed this as a great opportunity to uh, have the Hebrew University uh, involved in cutting edge uh, uh, work and policing and encouragement. So Hubert Williams and I at the time, we started out, it seemed impossible, but we worked out a whole plan that would allow me to bring my new ideas, uh, that the police foundation would hire enough new staff to be able to carry them out without me there all the time. And computers and everything else created possibilities and a lot of travel, I have to say, uh, to the United States to do things that were different. So I came to the Police Foundation. Um, I had was able to hire a very smart research director, Roseanne Greenspan, mm. uh, and a group of other people. Uh, and so I came there and I said, the crime place stuff in my mind was critical. Many, much of the other work, it sort of reached a plateau There were a group of uh, uh, experiments, but it was like uh, moving to the next generation becomes a question of studies. So, for example, I had this idea that uh, that uh, one of the most crucial questions that had not been examined was displacement. And I'd just written a paper a year earlier, in which I said most of the studies of displacement were were flawed. Now, everyone thought there was a common view that you you uh, focus in on a hot spot of crime, a block or a few street blocks, and then crime would just move around the corner. Indeed, some police officer in Minneapolis said that to me within the Minneapolis that hotspots. The police are still saying that today. And they're still saying yeah. it today, probably. Uh, so, I, um, so I said to myself, we need to do a study of displacement. That was crazy. I wasn't going to do a study of crime prevention. I was going to get a police department to do lots of crime prevention at a hotspot or multiple hotspots. And then I was going to study displacement. And I was going to design the whole study about displacement. So we, we put in an application to NIJ, it was $500,000, which at the time was large for the, for the grants. And uh, we got a great peer review and went out and did the study. This study, I think, had tremendous influence on my uh, getting the Stockholm Prize, but more generally in the field, because it was the first study that was totally focused on displacement. And it didn't find displacement, by the way. It found a, a diffusion of crime control uh, uh, benefits. But this is another key to my intellectual sort of direction that I have never, you know, there's, there's a, almost a problem in, in academic work. We reward people for advancing a particular area of study, but we almost reward them for always finding that their ideas are correct. But the truth is, what really makes for good science is challenging our ideas over and over again. We set a 5% significance threshold to make it hard on ourselves, not easy on ourselves. Yet if you look at the way we reward people in careers, many times it's when their studies work in a similar direction over a number of years. That is a bit of a problem because there's going to be, sometimes that happens, but often it's going to be managing in different ways and sometimes finding out it didn't work becomes a crucial issue. So this, this study we did was a challenge to the earlier studies because what I said was I don't think we were measuring displacement correctly. I think that's the way academic work should be done. It should be challenging your own work. It's not about, you know, bringing more accolades to your ideas. It's about challenging them. We're truth seekers. I tell this to my students all the time. We're truth seekers. I, I'm not a political figure. I'm not a, a, you know, I'm not a, I don't know, a television personality. We're truth seekers. Looking for the truth. This is Al Reese, by the way. Absolutely. Hard nose. We're looking for the truth. Interesting enough, many students today don't know who he was because he was so challenging his own ideas all the time. As opposed to some scholars of the time who created a theory and sort of then went on over and over again to produce information about that theory. But we're truth seekers, and the truth sometimes is painful, mm -hmm. but that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's what's distinct about your work, David? That it challenges uh, conventional wisdom, that it you know, uh, is a bit off the beaten path in some, in some regards? Yeah, I, I think that's one way of putting it. Not always a, a good career decision. You know, uh, today, in today's world, young criminologists 
have, be have become much more, I think, it's career very, conscious. It's very risky, this approach. In some yeah, ways. I mean, today people, you know, they're worried about how many citations am I going to get? Uh, um, you know, am I going to get in the right journals? If you take the kind of career approach I did, I don't know, I did, I think, pretty well overall, but it wasn't always strategically the most, uh, the best approach. My interests have always been challenging the boundaries. I like to take bigger leaps, you might want to say. And, and it's not because somehow I think there's a bigger pay dirt there. It's because intellectually, it seems to be that's what I have to do. And when we worked on white collar crime, we didn't go the conventional direction. What did I come up with in the end? Crimes of the middle classes. Everybody else at the time studying white collar crime was interested in getting those elites, those rich people. You know, that was the whole focus. And, I don't mean, you know, and from an academic focus as well. They would say focusing on a part of crime that we didn't really look at. There was another part of crime we didn't really look at. Crimes of the middle classes. And we thought it was a pretty large and important part. And much of what we called white collar crime was actually committed by middle class people as well. So that was a kind of unpopular. I remember when I, I, I called my book on white collar crime, published by Yale Press, Crimes of the Middle Classes. Gil Geis came up to me and said, David, I'm really glad you called the crimes of the middle classes and not white collar crime. <laughs> because it was like, what, where does this belong exactly? Uh, my work on crime place and policing at the time when I went into policing, uh, was, became really interested. It was not like the, you know, the, it was like, why are you going to policing, David? Conservative. Uh, at the time, everyone said the police can't be effective, and here you are going to effectiveness research. Right. I mean, I believe they could, and I found other scholars that did that agreed with me: John Eck, Larry Sherman, uh, 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 then my students and others. But at the time, it was completely crazy in some sense. Uh, uh, when I started getting into crime and place in a more theoretical way, I mean, here I am. I'm studying why crime places why. Have, why there's crime at these places, why hotspots of crime develop. And why the they characteristics. don't displace. And why they don't displace. And everybody else, or the majority of the profession, is studying why young juveniles become involved in crime. This is not good for your citation count, especially at the beginning. It's not going to get you the most recognition, maybe right at the outset. Uh, but for me, it was, the, it, was, it was what made it all interesting. I, I really find myself, uh, at this stage in my career as well, I created a journal of experimental criminology because I think this is an important area to advance. I could have easily edited one of the major journals in the field. It would have been smarter from a professional perspective to edit one of the major journals in the field. But I don't know, I think when it's all, when it's all done, you've got to turn around and say, uh, what did I do? Was it worthwhile? What kinds of contributions did I make? I tell my younger colleagues this about tenure. You have to be strategic about tenure. But if you only do what's strategic, you're going to get tenure, you're going to say, did I kill myself and work that hard for this? You have to have some passion that comes from the side. And in the end, I've got to believe that that produces some of the most important and best advances. And I, let me just say something else about uh, this issue, because you've asked about students today, really. Mm. Uh, and and I, I think you're thinking about like how to, what's the difference between today and then in terms of career development? And I, I thought about this a lot lately, and I begin a lot of my classes this way. When I went to graduate school, it was a depressing time to study crime. I mentioned this earlier. All our findings, all our data said, at least if you're interested in practical crime prevention, etc., uh, because what we knew didn't seem to have much impact. The police didn't seem to be effective no matter what we told them. Most correctional programs didn't seem to work. Even though the news is much better today, by the way, that was the environment then. So people walked into classes, it was depressing. And it's fun for only a certain period of time. It's a lot of fun if you're sitting at Yale to say, oh, the police can't be effective. You know, it's, to debunk is a lot of fun. But after you've done that for a year or two, it's not fun any longer. Because then what? Nothing works. You said it, it's done. Now what? What do you do? What do they do now? So uh, I think that uh, that negative atmosphere, if you retain some positive, in other words, when I walked the streets with the cops in New York, I think it had this, as I said, impact on me. It got me charged about this. It, I said to myself, you know what? The police could be effective. That was a major, that was a crazy thing for a young guy, 30 years old, to be saying. When everybody else, David Bailey was saying, the police couldn't be effective at all. So uh, I think that that atmosphere, combined with my early experiences, so it led me this idea of paradigm changes, if you like. Mm. 
uh, led me to, to try to change the way people were thinking about the crime problem. Don't think much, as much about people. Think about these small geographic areas, these hot spots of crime. Uh, be willing to examine whether uh, uh, the police are affected. Maybe we ought to change some of our methods, be more concerned with experimental methods. Students today come in much happier. They're happy. Uh, criminology works in almost every field you look at. Uh, uh, David Farrington and I are doing a systematic review of systematic reviews. We're publishing a book at Springer on this. We had a meeting that was jointly sponsored by GMU, Cambridge, and Israel, the Hebrew University. And uh, this book is full of a tremendous amount of good news, and the students around my table know it. They're happy. In order to get them depressed, I have to tell them to close their eyes and think about the way I went to graduate school. Now, the problem with that is that when you're that happy, it's easy to go with the flow. And I think that there's less pressure to innovate. There was a lot of pressure to innovate in the 1980s the 1990s. And I think that produced many of, of some of the most interesting ideas in the field. Mm -hmm. can, can we go back a little bit to the crime, to our crime in place discussion, David? Um, it, for some of the viewers who might not um, be uh, knowledgeable about some of your uh, contributions in crime in place, um, how did your work in crime in place push the boundaries? Because there were people doing uh, work in fields like social disorganization, for example. Can you kind of uh, talk a little bit about how um, your efforts in place-based criminology were more distinct and um, uh, contributed to the field in their own right? Well, I think the first contribution when Larry and I got together and started talking, we realized uh, that we did have a way to answer the question of why the police were not effective. From his experience in Minneapolis, from my experience in New York, we believed that the problem was the police were spreading their resources too thin. Why should you uh, uh, focus police resources indiscriminately across the city if the problems are focused just on a few blocks? Uh, 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 if 5% of the streets or addresses in the city are producing 50% of the crime, then shouldn't we be focusing our efforts on those places? So when Larry and I went out uh, to do the Minneapolis hotspots experiment, uh, this was a paradigm changer as well. This was the police can be effective at doing something about crime. Mm -hmm. We were talking about ordinary police patrol. I should know even that study, Larry and I, Larry said he never worked so hard in the grant that I was very difficult. This was the Al Reese uh, part of me. And, uh, uh, but when it was reviewed, reviewers didn't know how to handle it. They thought it was great, but they were worried about it. And they're actually gonna tell us to put the grant off for a year. Uh, why were they worried about it? Well, because large social experiments were not common at the time. If this was a randomized experiment, we were uh, uh, randomizing patrol in a whole police department, uh, hot spots of crime. These were all new ideas. Uh, they were positive, but said, well, maybe we ought to get this reviewed next year. Problem was, probably the only police chief in the country who was willing to do it was Tony Bozen, mm. uh, uh, who was just a, a really interesting fellow, uh, a very uh, intense. We just gave him the uh, award. Uh, the the evidence-based policing. Hall of Fame, Fame. award. That's right. uh, that you, Cynthia, thought of and developed in our center. And, uh, and he was really happy, but when I was there, I told a story about, uh, I, I was on a National Research Council committee at the age of uh, 31 or 32, uh, and I had to speak to this whole gigantic audience, National Academy of Sciences, I was really nervous. They told me at, at the NRC that I had time for a 20 or 25 minute talk. I practiced it 832 times, so I get it right. And when I sat down at the table, the chair of my session was Tony Bozer, the police chief from Minneapolis, and he turned to me and said, David, you have 15 minutes. If you talk more than 15 minutes, I'm pulling you off the stage. And he's like six foot something, so I was, I was, and he looked pretty serious to me at the time. So I quickly edited my speech and got through 15 minutes, and Tony said, great speech, David, but it was a stressful moment. That was Tony, and he was willing to, uh, uh, or, or at the time, and uh, is willing, I think, in many ways, in terms of the way he thinks, to think outside the box. So he was willing to go with this experiment, but he would only be police chief for another year and a half. So we couldn't wait. So we went back to the National Institute of Justice, and they, they developed a separate peer review committee for us. I'm not sure in the present system how that would work. But uh, we were able to get this study. The study, by the way, was $900,000. We're talking about 19... Um, uh, 88, 89, 90, that period. And that was an awful lot of money for NIJ to invest. I think Chip Stewart was a great supporter of 
experiments. That was one of the reasons. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, innovations. I think I've lost my track a bit. We are talking about things that, uh, paradigm changes, whatever. That was one of them. This Minneapolis hotspots experiment was a paradigm change because it brought attention to the hotspots idea, because it was a large experiment carried out in the world of policing. Unlike uh, 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 the Kansas City experiment, a lot less uh, vulnerable. Indeed, at the beginning, we called it a replication of Kansas City. Uh, 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 Kelling felt, how could it be a replication? You're doing hotspots and not precincts. He's right. But we meant replicating it sort of the right way. But I was going to move to, uh, uh, here, are the other, here are some other ways, right? You asked me about, uh, let's call it the paradigm. The things that I went out to do, some of them, by the way, uh, uh, that I, I thought through in those years that, uh, when I was primarily at Hebrew U. I should know, when I went to the Police Foundation, I kept my uh, a tenure appointment at Hebrew U and also ran the uh, research group. Uh, another key problem, and this I thought about at the Police Foundation, really, but I wasn't able to develop, when I got to the University of Maryland, I had this really smart young graduate student named Cynthia Lowe, who was assigned to me. And we started talking about uh, uh, another problem that was bothering me, because all of the research that had been uh, carried out so far on hotspots, a lot of it was practice-based. And one of the criticisms, situational prevention, it was based on sort of evaluation studies of policing. Mm -hmm. Minneapolis hotspots experiment, Jersey City drug market analysis experiment, even Larry's original uh, article uh, on this issue was drawn from work he was doing in a randomized experiment, I believe, on recap. So uh, uh, I said to myself, what about the more basic theoretical questions, empirical questions? In particular, if there are criminal careers of people, if I want this area of work to get the same sort of grounding in basic research, we have to look at the criminal careers of places. And you and I, Cynthia, that's the sort of the next step that we embarked on. And we wrote, I don't remember, grant proposals and didn't succeed at first. Mm -hmm. But then received a, a grant for, I think, only $350,000, not only, That's but, right. yeah. <laughs> but we worked a lot harder than that uh, 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 to look at what happened over time in crime in uh, Seattle. Remember, we looked for uh, cities that had long longitudinal uh, databases. And we found something interesting there when we did this. Uh, we found, first of all, that the 5% rule, if you want to call it, 5% of the crime producing, excuse me, 5% of the places producing 50% of the crime was not just a rule across individual years. Uh, uh, the concentration of crime seemed to be fairly constant across years. We looked at 14 years, every one of those years for 14 years, 50% of the crime came from just 5% of the street segments in the city. Um, we also did a trajectory analysis, and we found that 1% of the streets during that 14-year period produced 23% of the crime. We called them chronic crime hotspots. Uh, after we finished our work together, and you went off to uh, uh, eventually George Mason, but uh, uh, I worked with uh, 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 Liz Groff, who's now in Temple, and Suming Yang, who's now in Taiwan, uh, on the next question, which really was, what explains those chronic crime hotspots. What explains those different trajectories? And we actually uh, collected data, uh, much data in Seattle, looking at all kinds of uh, uh, characteristics of these micro places. Can, can I ask you uh, just a question about the micro places, David? Just going back to what you're talking about, about practice. Would you say that uh, the practice of criminal justice, your early influences at Vera, uh, your um, uh, influences with the Minneapolis hotspots experiment, that those more practical applications led you to think about micro places before you started thinking, okay, about more basic theoretical questions? Yeah, I think the, the research of the police when I walked the beat mm -hmm. with these cops, mm -hmm. that got me thinking about these small worlds. Yeah. And then these theoretical and academic elements reinforce, you know, in criminology a lot of people you know, you, you do something like you discover that 1% of the places produces 23% of the crime over a 14-year period, the same places, and they say, well, that's only descriptive, yeah. right? I mean, well, man, descriptive work is a precursor, not necessarily following theory. Make, then you have to start thinking of the theories. Why? Why do those places stay hot? What is it about them? Um, you know, the, 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 what I've been working on over the last few years, this project I, I mentioned before, uh, a retrospective study 
of places to try to understand in a traditional criminological way, a basic research program, not a uh, applied research program. Uh, we just published a book, it's called The Criminology of Place, uh, Street Segments and Our Understanding of the Crime Problem, published by Oxford University Press. All the maps and stuff are in color, I'm very proud, uh, so you get a really good sense of this. Uh, it allowed us to take this next step of going beyond the work we had done, for example, uh, advancing further uh, into this sort of world, you know, keep asking these sorts of questions. Uh, the biggest advances uh, in this study, beyond what we've done before, I think first was something we'd really noticed before, which was we're able to specify really carefully the street-by-street -street variability of crime uh, uh, in cities. Uh, our work challenges traditional conceptions in that we, we say it's not necessarily that the community has an impact, but there's also an impact at a more micro level, a more local impact. And we're able to show that street by street variability in crime, uh, uh, I think uh, graphically and really well, and also statistically. But we're also able to show that variability in terms of the factors that might be related to crime. Uh, and traditionally, opportunity theorists, people like Clark, the Branninghams, uh, um, and others, Marcus Felsen, have advocated the idea that it's opportunity that brings crime to specific sorts of places. Uh, we found that in our work, but we're one of the first studies to really show that in a large empirical inquiry, like the longitudinal studies we have on individuals. But we also found that social disorganization characteristics, drawn mostly from sociology, also show that kind of street level variability. But what most fascinated me, for example, was Rob Sampson developed an idea about collective efficacy, the way in which communities, uh, uh, individuals and communities are willing to intervene in public affairs, and therefore communities in which that occurs uh, seem to be able to insulate themselves more from crime. We used a voting behavior on individual street segments to look at that sort of issue, that people were more willing to vote in, in elections, we felt the collective efficacy was higher. We found that streets with higher collective efficacy varied from street to street. In other words, you'd have a hot spot of collective efficacy and then a cool spot. So there's tremendous variability street by street which says there may be another indicator. And when we took these indicators and related them to, uh, to uh, trajectories of crime, in particular crime, chronic crime trajectories, we found that opportunity perspective have strong influence. But we found that collective efficacy and poverty varying at the local level of crime also influence uh, trajectories of crime as well. So, you know, these are, uh, I guess these are uh, uh, ideas of, uh, the career is partially sometimes making paradigm jumps. Partially it's, it's following those up in ways that ask the next set of questions. I, I'm curious uh, as to what you think about um, all of your your life's work in, in terms of challenging different um, uh, areas of terminology, uh, you must have received some resistance uh, uh, in the areas of your work in experimental criminology or crime in place, because it does push the boundaries in many ways, David, um, uh, of some uh, traditional criminological ideas. Uh, just to shift gears a little bit, um, can you talk a, a bit about um, you know, maybe some of the resistance that you've had to some of these new ideas. And as a criminologist, you know, how have you worked through some of, some of that resistance? Look, I think that uh, the resistance comes in all sorts of ways. It's not always direct. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you stay, if you kind of stake out new ground and ask new questions, you're, you're naturally challenging the, the predominant paradigms of the period. So here's what happens. So you start writing about an area you're really interested in, like crime and place, or even the effectiveness of policing. What you find is many people say, well, those aren't interesting areas. I mean, I, our main concern is in, let's say, theoretical questions related to developmental patterns of crime over the life course. If you're going to stake out in their territory, you know, people think you stake out in their territory and these guys with flags are standing there cheering you on. In fact, <laughs> What often happens is that you're very alone. Uh, small social networks are very important in this regard. A lot of other people are kind of wondering why you're doing this. And sometimes they'll say, that's really interesting, David, but it's not that key and important. And then it becomes your job to bring it more into the mainstream, if you like. Um, sometimes some of the resistance uh, 
is disciplinary. Sometimes it's, there are interests involved. Uh, I think sometimes uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of resistance to development of experimental criminology. And I've been surprised by the resistance in some sense. From a methodological perspective, there's no question that experiments provide uh, a better way, if you like, of coming to conclusions about the effectiveness of programs and practices. Uh, experiments have a great ability uh, to create equivalence, or at least to allow you to assume equivalence uh, uh, between different groups, and therefore to come to a conclusion about whether something works or not. Yet there's strong resistance. Some of the resistance, I've always thought, comes from the fact that people somehow feel it's going to challenge, you know, academia is a place. Someone once wrote about academia, uh, uh, never have so many fought so hard for so little. So academia is a place where, you know, the resources are tight. And people sometimes feel that, if, you know, it's a battle over those resources. Some people view the profession uh, as a battle over ideas, and they think you have to push your side of the battle. I've always thought of it as kind of a, uh, a searching for truth, as I mentioned before. Um, the resistance is hard when you're younger. Uh, it's harder to get published, both because it may not be the central interest of the discipline. If you publish in certain areas where things are hot, uh, if you're stake out new areas, they're not hot. They're, they're new areas. Uh, you'll have more difficulty. Staking out a new area means your ideas are not going to be as well formed. It, it, it took me, I realized, about 20 years working in the area of crime place to really get the narrative right. I think in the book, a Criminology of Place Now, I think I have a really cohesive narrative uh, that's complex but clear. And when you're younger and you're just getting started, all the pieces don't fit so well. You haven't done a lot of the work to make the pieces fit so well. So you get a lot of resistance in that people say, that's not well formed enough, etc. So you get a lot of kickback. You know, in some ways, your work in evidence-based crime policy, which you uh, advance today, is, is kind of built from many years of creating a narrative about experiments, about systematic reviews, about um, evaluation, the importance of evaluation in practice. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit about that, David, as we, as we wrap up this interview. Um, because that also, I think, is an area in criminal justice and criminology that is also pushing the boundaries, in a sense, um, this notion of evidence-based crime policy. It very much fits in your narrative uh, uh, but it still is, um, I think, something that is new. It's an innovation in some ways. Yeah, I, I think that um, many people that focus on practice in the past were not necessarily the most theoretical, the most cutting edge of the sort of science research, as you want to call it. And there was a bit of tension. Uh, throughout my career, I've always felt that cutting edge science, cutting edge methods, and the issue of being relevant to practice and policy went together and were not in conflict. That was not necessarily a popular idea. Indeed, if you look at some of my career development, uh, being at the Abe University, uh, when I came, uh, after I was at the Police Foundation, the University of Maryland invited me uh, 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 to come as a, a professor of criminology. Maryland was a very, very strong theoretical criminology department. Uh, that's where we met. and. Um, uh, I was able to arrange a joint tenure agreement, so I was a professor at both universities, so it worked out really well. Al would be surprised at all that happened in all those years. But uh, Maryland, for me, was not a stretch in the sense that I was really interested in theory. Being in Maryland was a great place for me because there were lots of really thoughtful people uh, challenging the boundaries of criminology. Now, my view was, if we're going to challenge the boundaries of criminology, we also have to challenge the boundaries of the real worlds of crime and justice. So my work was, uh, uh, my work continually was at that intersection. Indeed, when I went to Mason uh, 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 five years ago, part of the reason was that I saw Mason as a place that was very invested in the policy arena. And you know, when we spoke together about forming the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy, I said, do you want to do this? I said, we could really push the cutting edge, uh, creating absolutely cutting edge research based on great theory, but tackling uh, specific crime problems. And here's a thought of mine that's probably different from many criminologists. I think the future of criminology is very much embedded in the real world of crime and justice, like medicine and education. 
It's not that I think the future of, of criminology is not about theory, is not about great statistical work and innovations in statistical work. I think that's true. But I think the next step for us, the place we have to go in the future, is into the world, real world. It has to be that police, corrections, they see us as relevant. Al Reese once said to me, he wrote an article, it was called Making the Scene. Uh, it was an article on the sociology of deviance. And, and I always used to use that phrase quite often. I think criminology has to make the scene. We have to bring ourselves into the real world. If we make the scene, we'll change the future of criminology. Criminology right now is an underfunded science. Uh, I've done really well with grants in my career, but there's not a lot of money in criminology. The grants tend to be, compared to fields like medicine, even education these days, relatively small. The National Institute of Justice, for all the fields we know about, has $50 million of funding a year for research. All the fields. Uh, in education now, there's over $200 million. And in medicine, there's $30 billion. But medicine's a bit of an aberration in this regard, perhaps. But nonetheless, I think we have the potential for that. But to do that, we have to make the scene. Because those other fields, the, the research world has made itself relevant. It's made the scene. So I'm looking at making the scene as advancing criminology, not as sort of a negative direction to go to, not something you have to go to. I have now a study that was just funded by uh, NIDA, the National Institute of Health. It's the next generation of crime place studies. Uh, when you get to my stage, you can still think of the next generation. And it's a prospective longitudinal study. I would have thought of going to the National Institute of Justice, but when I put together the study, it demanded at least $3 million of funding. And in justice, there's just often not those kinds of resources. So I went to NIH, and the study has strong uh, um, public health issues as well. I'm glad I did it, because I think it's really interesting. Issues about AIDS and mental health, physical health problems that develop at crime hotspots, how they develop, why, etc. But at the same time, I think this making the scene becomes important. Just as another idea with this, it's not only making the scene, it's bringing practice to take some ownership of research and what we do. Uh, if we're going to make it, the people in practice have to feel a part of this. They have to take ownership of it. But taking ownership of it does not mean some of my colleagues thought I was crazy when I wrote this in a piece for the Harvard Executive Session with Peter Nehru, a practitioner, practitioner researcher. Really. And, uh, but what I meant, I didn't mean that the, we were going to give them ownership of science and then, they, and then science would go downhill because they didn't know what they were doing. What I meant was that they would understand, like many medical practitioners, that cutting edge experimental work was essential for them, that they needed it to advance in what they were doing. That's something we have to do. We'll have to do those things in the future. And that's why I think the work we're doing at Mason is so important in the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy. Because this issue is becoming, uh, I think, by the way, the uh, John Lau, when he became director of the National Institute of Justice, when he coined the term translational criminology, uh, we use that for the magazine that you're editing, uh, uh, it says that these ideas that we're developing are, uh, are, are getting some salience out there. Many people are beginning to realize the importance of this idea of making the scene. I think that's a great way to wrap up our session today, David. Um, I, I think I have one final question for you uh, that I, uh, I think would be a good way to end this conversation. Um, if you had to think about advice that you would give to your students and, and also what you would like to, where would you like to see those that you've mentored uh, go uh, in the future, um, what would that be? You know, what would make you happy in terms of uh, where your students would be in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, I have to start that with a preface by saying that many people view students as a sort of resource, you know, to get things done. Uh, I've been enriched by the students I've worked with in my career. All of my work is better because of people who partnered with me. Uh, you, Anthony Braga, uh, I'm going to forget people and then I'll feel bad after you. Red Mazaro, Liz Groff, Sumin Yang, and just uh, Anthony Petrosino, and just many, many more people. Uh, Talia Natan more recently, and Baraka Royale, and Cody Tellup. I mean, just bunches of these. And uh, these haven't been like, this is not a one way street. Uh, the truth is, a good mentor appreciates the value of students. I mean, all through my career, I've appreciated what my students have given to my work, and given to me, and that's why they're co-authors of my work. 
I think that's why they do and so that's well. That's why they co-author with each other. <laughs> I'm still it's co-authoring like with the students I that's started right. with 30, 25 years ago. Right. But, but I, I think that a key element here is not only to think about what uh, uh, we bring to our students, but the truth is that by opening yourself up to students, uh, you bring it. Uh, they bring incredibly good things to you. People are not interchangeable. Everyone brings a different set of talents. We could not. I could not have done that piece we did in chronology on trajectories without you. It was something we did together. So the. Uh, I think you've got to. Maybe the, the terms have to be thought of uh, 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 a bit differently. In terms of what I expect from my students, I think another element is that you shouldn't have expectations in one way. What you do is, uh, when it, with my students, I think that's why they've done so well, many of them have become predominant in the field, is that they work with me and they learn how to work. They develop their own ideas. They're not clones of me. Right. I do not expect them to be David Weisberg's small. You know, we are David Weisberg could talk to the same people. <laughs> they, I expect them to be independent thinkers from that's the beginning. Right. And I want them to go out there. Now what I do expect is they'll get certain things. The importance of, of methods, of being careful. The importance of truth. It's not just getting the data to say your idea is true, but finding the truth. Uh, the importance of working really hard. The importance of being fair to ideas and being strong intellectually. Uh, those are the things I'm looking for. And then I want those people to stake out new ground. Uh, and I think they have. So I've been, uh, I've been extraordinarily lucky. Uh, and the proof of the pudding, as you've said before, I still work with my students. Uh, we're still working together on all sorts of things, my students, and my students throughout my career work with each other. Uh, we've got a little community going, That's I think, right. of uh, scholars. Of, uh, it's you a know, support group. A support group. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, uh, what I can say to, as I think about this, criminology is a great profession. It is. It allows us to do so many interesting things. Uh, young people should be aware of letting strategy lead them in directions that doesn't allow them to challenge their intellectual interests, to go with their gut, to go into places that may be insecure, a little less shaky, uh, because going those directions, you're gonna feel a lot more satisfied with your career. Now, we said that you have to be strategic, you have to get tenure, you have to be concerned with being recognized, all the things are true, but you have to leave room for this, those things in your stomach that tell you to go in a certain direction. Uh, that leads you to, to all kinds of interesting ideas that excite you, that, uh, that make it worthwhile. You know, the, the, the most fun part I find is when we discover something. And then we have to publish it, and that's fun too, but, but it's really that moment when you discover it. You know you've learned something new, and you've answered that question you had. Uh, the, the, we're lucky people to be able to spend our lives uh, doing those sorts of things. And that's why some people never retire, I guess, but we're lucky. Chronology is a good profession. That, that is so true. On, on that note, uh, thank you, Professor David Weisberg, for this interview. Thank you, Cynthia. And uh, we appreciate it.